Okay, uh, this is basically just um, last week, one of last week's slide. Okay, so the elements in research design. Just a quick recap. So you have your, for your own individual research, you have your aims and objectives. Okay, and then you go about designing your strategy. So you have your data collection, what is exactly your methods, your sampling design, and then you develop your instrument. Okay, and lastly, you collect your um, data. And after that is you analyze that data according to what you've already designed in research design strategy. Okay, so you can imagine why research design is very, very important. Um, so one thing that I want to highlight, okay, because I noticed this is one thing that we haven't touched upon in the previous classes. Okay? So in your research, there's always going to be variables. So what is a variable? Variable is a characteristic of the participants or situation. Okay, For a given study that has different values. So you can, when I put here participants, right? So it can be... Um, when you're doing survey, okay, so you have your participants, or even if you're doing experiment, experimental study where it involves people, so all those is called participants. But at the same time, there's also situation, okay? So characteristic of a situation. So for example, if you're doing experiments, and you know you have your um, temperature, all those um, uh, all the environmental condition is called variable. Okay, so it must have different values. Now, uh, a variable must vary, okay, or have different values in the study. So let's say if your participants are male or female, so gender is a variable. You have age is a variable. Or if you have type of intervention program you know so it's it covers a lot of um, a lot of things actually factors so if you have a um, waste segregation program okay so in your study perhaps you want to introduce one program to this one community okay which involves waste segregation program so the type of program that is a variable okay or um, so I put that a variable if more than one or one type and a control. So keep that in mind. That is also something very important later on, as you can see. So if it only has one value, okay, it is a constant. It's not a variable. So um, if your participants are all female, for example. So remember just now gender is male and female. It's a variable because you have two. But now, if your participants are only female, then gender is not, not uh, no longer a variable. So it's a constant. Okay, so I hope you can understand um, the meaning you know, of variable because this is quite important later on, especially when you're designing your study. Okay, you have to tell us what is the variable. Okay? So variable is commonly divided into independent, okay, dependent, an extra news variable. Okay, so there's three types of uh, variables. I'm sure if you still remember in high school, if you take uh, science or even in um, primary schools, when we do uh, science, you know, you have your labs. Um, there's always that um, lab report. Okay. And you have to put in, okay, what is the independent variables? What is the dependent variable? So this is very similar. Okay, so it's a familiar concept, so I hope it's not a totally new thing to you guys. Okay, so variable is divided into independent, right? So what is independent variable? So it is one that is varied or manipulated by the research, okay, by the researcher, sorry. So it has two types. You have active independent variable and you have attribute independent variable. Okay, uh, so for active, okay, please bear with me. This is quite, um, you know, it's 
it's very descriptive. So maybe you can't understand it while looking at it once, but I'm sure you will understand better when you study later. Okay, so you have active. So um, the meaning of active here, okay, so you have um, some sort of situation or one, one sort of program, treatment, intervention. So you give that to your participants within the specified period of time. Okay. And um, so taking the previous example, right? So you introduce a waste segregation program. So that is an active independent variable. Okay. But if you um, are looking at people who have been involved in the program, for example, and you are not the one who is introducing that program. Okay. So for example, um, the ministry already has one similar program. So you are, as a researcher, you come in and you just look at the effect. Okay. So you can imagine that. So the program is not you that introduce it. So it's not active. Right. So um, you do not measure that. And that becomes the dependent variable. Okay, so I hope you. Sometimes it's very. Um, so you cannot just put it in a box. What I can say, um, because I cannot tell you, um, like A is A, B is B. Okay, so it really depends on your own research. Okay, you have to identify it yourself. What is your independent variable? What is your dependent and what is your extraneous? Uh, so the thing um, that is important is that you have to remember you have independent and you have dependent. So why is that important? So independent is what you vary and dependent is what you measure. Okay, so you're always going to have that two uh, variables in your research. Okay, you always want to see what is the effect of one thing towards another. So you manipulate that um, independent variables and look at the dependent variables. So what is the result of certain program or certain you know, environmental factors? Okay, so I hope you can understand that. Um, so I put in like a few examples. Right, so dependent variable is a response that is measured. Okay, it assess the effect of independent variable. Okay, so if you have questionnaires, so the ratings that your respondents gave, that is your dependent variable. Okay, the readings from your instrument, if you're going to the field and you take some measurements, that data is your dependent variable. Okay. And another thing is extraneous uh, variable or also control also call control variable. Okay. So you are not particularly interested in that variable, but it could influence the reading that you get. Okay, so basically your dependent variable. So they need to be ruled out or control. Okay. So like I said previously, um, if you are measuring um, some data Okay, some uh, sound pollution maybe. So you go to the field and you measure the sound at a particular place. Okay, um, that is basically your dependent and independent. Be some other things that will um, give you different data. Okay, so something uh, that the factors that is not what you measure or what you manipulate, that is the extraneous variable. Um, so why is that important, guys? Okay, because uh, we have this theory of causality and um, research design. Okay, sorry. Why? All right. I fast forward to, okay. So theory of causality and research design. So most of the times, these extraneous variables um, they are available in every study you, and you cannot eliminate it, but they can be controlled. Okay. And um, the impact of extraneous. Oops, sorry. Why do I get a call? Uh, 
Okay, let me just quickly check. I think. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, sorry guys, because I got a call and I had to check something. Okay, so we go back. So, uh, what I wanted to say is you have your um, control, you know, extraneous variables and you have to control that because um, you have a study, okay, if you look at this um, figure here, the change in dependent variable, okay, so this is something that you measure, all right? So when people ask, how sure are you that um, what you do, what you manipulated, which is your independent variable, is the only thing that, you know, give effects to your, uh, what you measure, okay? There's always going to be some question about that. So you have to remember the dependent variable, what you measure is um, a total of the change that happens because of the independent variable, okay? So what you actually manipulated plus your extraneous variable, which is something that you cannot control, but it's already, it's always at this, okay? And last one, change because of chance, right? So what is chance here? So if you look at, um, so uh, for example, yeah, if you have your survey, for example, questionnaire, you have your population, okay? So there's always going to be um, some error that comes from chance, okay? There's a possibility that people um, gave uh, wrong answer or uh, they are very biased towards something, okay? So that is chance. You cannot really control that. It happens because uh, of chance. And extraneous variable is because, um, you know, the environmental factors that you cannot control, okay? So the, what, so here would be a bit more, um, you know, clear, okay? So for example, if you have um, a program, okay? So you have three R program. This is just an example. Um, reuse, recycle, and reduce, right? So you have your study population, Okay, maybe some uh, community in Slango, for example. Okay, and what you want to actually see is how effective is that program. Okay, so here you have your independent variable is the program. Okay, this is your population, right? And the effectiveness here is your dependent variable. Okay, but there's always going to be some extraneous variable, you know. Okay, some people might so you can imagine the program uh, maybe is conducted within one year okay i'm not saying you have to do it one year okay uh, but you know usually you can see the effect of a program uh, after a period of time so let's say for this one one year okay so within that one year your population might have you know um after three months suddenly they found um they realize, oh, actually 3R is very good, not because of your program, but because of um, some other things that you cannot control, okay? Or maybe they uh, have changes in economic condition, okay? Maybe during COVID, some people are losing their jobs, okay? So they cannot really um, think about, um, you know, buying things. So instead they recycle things, okay? That is not true. Um, you cannot say that it's totally come from your program, but it may come from their uh, very own uh, individual situation, okay? So that is what I meant when you say extraneous variable, you cannot control that, okay? And also that's because of um, chance, okay? So for your population, you know, maybe some people are very, very, 
you know, positive towards 3R program. So when you give your questionnaire to them, they always give you answers that is very, you know, oh yes, um, very, very interested. You know, I do this all the time. But at the end of the spectrum, there's people who are very, very negative. For example, oh, I don't want to do TR program. Okay, there is um, a possibility of chance there. Okay, but uh, usually, usually, okay, we put change because of chance is zero. Why? Why is that? Okay, because remember when I say people who are so negative and people are so positive. So in the end, um, we say that they cancel each other out, okay? Because um, that's why population is also very important, okay? When you have a wide enough population, okay? Um, I will just put this here, okay? So remember, if you have ever taken statistics, okay, you have that bell-shaped curve, right and your population is in there basically okay and you know the very negative ones would be here and the very positive ones would be there okay so the effect they cancel each other out so that's why people say that change because of chance is zero okay but that will depend on your population okay and your um, sampling design is something that we are going to look at next week Okay, how you going to uh, choose the number of population? Okay, so that is very important, and I hope you can understand why based on this. Okay, uh, just one last thing before that, before we leave this slide. So extraneous variables, you can um, mitigate that problem by having a control group. Okay, um, so this applies even in experiments or even if you're doing survey study, okay, if you have a control group, you can uh, basically, you can calculate the change that happens because of, you know, extraneous variables. So you can actually um, say, oh, yes, it's because of in the change independent variable is happened because of the independent variables and extraneous variables, but I already calculate this one, okay, the extraneous. So you can like be very confident, you say, yes, this is due to this because of what? Okay. Right, um, now we go to the next one, okay, categories of research design. Okay, uh, this is actually just something that I want to um, stress out, okay. If you go into literature or you search for research design, there's going to be you know, a lot of different ways of categorizing it. So I put this here. For example, you have uh, people who say, oh, research design is categorized into two, positivist and interpretive. Okay. And another one say, oh, into three, quantitative, qualitative, mixed method. And you have something like this which I've shown last week. Okay. Or there's also people who say exploratory, descriptive, explanatory. So what I'm trying to convey is there's no um, one correct way of categorizing it. And I don't want you to, you know, memorize this anyway, because categorizing is not something that um, you, sh you just have to know. Okay. But you don't have to, while you're doing your research design, you have to think about um, what fits what you're doing, okay? So if you're very clear on your topic, on your aims, you know, you have your research questions, okay, you can already think about, all right, in this research, I might, do, I might have to do this, I need this and that, and I have to analyze this and that, okay? That's basically how you look at designing your research strategy. Okay, so you have to choose um, the strategy that best suit the needs and purpose. Okay. Next. Right, for example, okay, this is something um, I just want to share because it's um, the 
generalization is quite good. Okay, so for example, if you have um, your, you want to explore the relationship between your dependent and independent variables, okay, you can do that through two ways, experimental or non-experimental, okay, and you can look at the specific approach, okay, so with experimental, usually you have randomized and you have quasi-experimental, okay, so just FYI, randomized, is something that we will look at also next week okay so this relates to your sampling your um, number of samples okay the sampling design basically and you know the specific purpose of course you can look at that uh, we have covered some of that in our second lecture before okay so you can just if you want to you can go back but we will look at some of that um, in a few minutes, okay. But I just want to show here, like for um, criteria, okay. So for those who are trying to look at, you know, qualitative design, qualitative study, okay, your um, variable might not be numbers, okay. So you will have words. So basically, they are attributes. Okay. And you can use this as a guide, basically. So you um, independent variables, if you do comparative or associational um, type of design, okay, you can look at, okay, you don't have, you cannot control the independent variable, okay, because usually it's already happened. Okay, so I'm saying this for a qualitative um, design, right? And um, yeah. So, just there to guide you if you need um, some help with that, okay? So, next is, I just want to go very briefly about this because I remember we've talked about exploratory, explanatory um, research before, but I just want to, you know, highlight this because it might give you more idea, okay? So, for exploratory um, research, Okay, I don't know if you remember, I've used this um, not example before. Okay, right. So in exploratory research technique, okay, you usually do that at the beginning of your research process. Okay, so when basically when you're doing your uh, literature review even, it's already some sort of exploratory research that you're doing because you're trying to find out more about your study, okay? But you can also do that uh, sort of research for your dissertation, okay? But of course, it's going to be more and more detail, okay? So for example, you can do um, systematic literature review, okay? Um, you can Google that. I don't think I will cover that unless we have time uh, later in the course, okay? Because that's very, very extensive. Right? Um, you can use this when you have little or no previous knowledge about the topic of study, okay? And you want to diagnose a situation or you want to look at the alternatives or you want to discover new ideas, right? So it can be done through secondary data analysis, uh, focus group interviews, pilot studies, case studies, and experience survey, okay? So if you are thinking of doing any of this, then you might about um, spe specifically saying, okay, I'm doing exploratory study, but you have to be uh, prepared, okay? Because exploratory study, as I mentioned, it's usually done at the beginning. Okay, so you have to be, you have to justify why you're doing this, okay, and whether it's enough for your dissertation, okay. Um, next one is descriptive, okay, so you can, if you compare, for exploratory you have this, but for descriptive, you go straight ahead to problem definition, so you already know what sort of problem you want to look at. So you definitely start to define the program and you describe, okay? 
So usually this is conducted using uh, the survey method. So you have interviews or questionnaires, right? And you will, um, the selection of sample design also follows what exactly you want to do in the descriptive study. So it can be probability or it can be non-probability uh, sampling design, right? This may make more sense. So I don't really touch on this part yet because we haven't covered that in detail. Okay, so just think about um, the basic, the methods first. Okay, are you going to do survey? Are you going to do experiment? Are you just going to observe? Or are you doing case studies? Okay, think about that. And um, then when we start to look into sampling design and data analysis, then you can, you know, match what you're doing, what you're doing with what's available. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, so the previous two is non-experimental, okay, but this one we start to go into experimental. So in experimental research design, okay, so don't worry when people say experimental, it doesn't um, always mean, you know, experiment in the lab. Okay, so it can also be, you know, field work, you go to the field, you take some data, right? But um, here I just want to look at two. So explanatory uh, research, it examines the cause and effect relationship, okay, rather than associational. So um, I give you an example here, okay. So if the study is interested in determining the important variable associated with the problem, it's called correlational or associational study. Okay, it's not explanatory. So with cancer and smoking, does smoking cause cancer? That is a causal um, sort of research. Okay, whereas are smoking and cancer related? It's correlational. Um, type of study. Okay. It might um, sound similar, but it's not because uh, here you really want to say you, you want to um, search okay, whether it's true that smoking causes cancer, whereas here it's just a relationship. Okay. So you can imagine here it would be a bit more uh, detail. You know, the study will be uh, will be designed in such a way that makes you able to prove that yes, smoking causes cancer, right? So you want to understand why that thing happened. And that is built in, in your method and also your design, um, sampling design and data analysis, right? Uh, but for experimental, Okay, um, I know I've said experimental. So the causal before is also experimental. And this one is, um, so it follows the principles found in natural sciences. It can be in lab or in real life. Okay, so experiments are ideal because they can directly uh, address cause and effect relationship issue. Okay, and why why experimental uh, sort of design is very important because you know the data collection techniques it holds the greatest potential for establishing cause effect relationship okay okay um so i'm just <laughs> okay all right quantitative and qualitative study okay so um, these are the so basically this slide is to give you more idea in terms of the um, the difference between the two okay so we have um, for these are the methods. OK, 
Okay. So you have your um, quantitative. Usually it involves experimental design or correlational or survey. Okay. And you have your qualitative research, which involves grounded theory, narrative research, and ethnographic. There's also a lot of others. Okay. We'll go briefly to that after this. Right. But um, what I want to highlight here is here actually. So with um, quantitative study, you have to make sure that your data is reliable and valid. Okay. So these two, we will cover in um, the measurement lecture. Okay. I can't remember which one is that. I think it's in the next two weeks. So we'll see how your um, measurement, how to make it reliable and how to make it valid. Okay, the data that you have. Whereas for qualitative study, okay, so you can look at the difference between the two, right? So qualitative is trustworthiness, okay, and authenticity. Okay, it's very different. That's why uh, with qualitative study and quantitative study, um, there's always this, um, you know, disconnect people who say qualitative study is not good or um, only quantitative study is, uh, you know, established research. So to me, I mean, that is not true, okay? Both has its own strengths and weaknesses, right? And people are beginning to look at mixed method design because it combines these two and, you know, it um, highlights the strengths of both, okay? Uh, so what I can also add to this, so for qualitative study, um, you basically, you are dealing with words, okay, and images. While uh, for quantitative studies, it's numbers, it's totally on numbers, okay. And there are instances where numbers cannot, um, cannot explain a situation. You can only use words. That's where qualitative study is very um, strong. Okay. But how you are, um, but to me personally, qualitative research is very, very hard because you re it's very hard to make it, um, you know, valid in terms of um, how you're going to make sure it's very structured. Okay. There are ways to do it, right? But because I'm mainly a quantitative uh, researcher, so it's very um, something quite foreign to me. But there are uh, scientific and you know strategic ways of dealing with quantitative research. If you're interested in that, then uh, you can look at that a bit more detail. Okay, there's a lot of resources. Okay, so um, just sharing an example. Okay, so for quantitative study, for example, in experimental uh, design, okay, you have your population, you have your sample, okay, and then remember the control group just now. So you have your control group condition and you have your experimental group. So you do your experiments or you do your survey or you do your program, you measure your uh, dependent variables and you compare the results. You have the differences between this one and this one, okay. So remember the figure before, like um, the effect of independent plus um, extraneous plus your uh, chance, okay. So if you have group, you can already uh, get the effect of extraneous um, variables and you can finally conclude, okay, what is your conclusion? Whereas for uh, survey design, so this is just an example, okay? So you have your site, okay? Where you want to do your survey, okay? Who is the population? You collect your data. You have your uh, primary data, which is your survey, and you might need some secondary data. So secondary data, maybe you look at, you know, census, okay? Banci and penduduk. So census or governmental report, and you compare that, you analyze it, you get your um, findings from that. Okay. okay. So 
compare that to qualitative study, right? So you have the methodology. So for example, here it uses ethnography. Okay, so basically it's quite, um, the flow is quite similar, right? So you have your community who is exactly your population, but you, in qualitative study, it must be specific to the context. So for example, if you're trying to look at culture or people's behavior, you have to make the context specific. Okay, because remember for qualitative study, it's um, apl applicable to a certain population only. Okay, so it's not, usually it's not um, something that you can generalize to the whole world or to the whole of Malaysia. Okay, so the sample selection, um, it can be probability, it can be non-probability. Okay. You have your data collection, you have your verification, your analysis. So you see the, the flow is very similar, qualitative or quantitative design. It's basically how you are um, designing it, okay, and make sure that it's um, in the end, it gives you the results that you want and, and it answers the uh, research questions that you have. Okay. Right. So um, because we have gone through a lot of, um, you know, <clears throat> description about quantitative study. So here I just want to share with you qualitative um, studies. So, but this is very brief, don't worry. So we have case study, we have ethnography, eth ethnomethodology, phenomenology and grounded theory. Okay, so for case study, this is actually um they do alam lah i can say it's um it can either be qualitative or you can also do quantitative study with case study because what it is is basically a bounded system okay so you have your case yes and it's bound you have your boundary um and you uh, do your research based on that boundary only Okay, so that's case study. But ethnography, you know, ethno, ethnic, okay, it's a specific cultural uh, social phenomenon, right? So usually this is more about culture. Oh my God. Okay, this is uh, ethnography uses um, uh, research about specific cultures in specific um, social class or, you know, demographic population. Okay, ethno methodology. Okay, method. So you can link that to it investigates people's uh, procedures. You know, to create or uh, manage something. Okay, how they do certain things. Um, that's when you do ethno methodology study. Whereas for a phenomenology, you know, phenomenon. So it's basically what happened, okay? So how people, uh, the experience of one um, specific community, for example, how they deal with it. So um, what I can link to this, okay, some people who have undergone, you know, tsunami, for example, in Aceh, okay? How they um, react to that or how they, bounded back okay the life after the tsunami so the qualitative phenomenology study will look at how people um, you know perceive the world after something happened okay and lastly uh, sorry there's more after this but grounded theory okay it uses uh, the interplay between analysis and data collection to produce theory Okay, so this is very different from quantitative study because in quantitative, you have your theory and then you do your data, con data collection and analysis based on that theory. But grounded theory, you collect data first, you analyze that and then you produce theory. Okay. Right. 
Um, then we have also participatory um, action research. Okay, so this is usually, you know, you try to find the role of knowledge, okay, as a significant instrument of power and control. Okay, so basically how you empower, um, you know, how certain things empower people to do something. Okay, this can also be um, related to, you know, when I talk about programs before. Okay, so if you remember just now, the example is about effective, uh, how effective a program is. Okay, uh, the three R program. Whereas for, if you look at that in a qualitative way, okay, uh, instead of the effectiveness of the program, you look at how people are empowered. Okay, so you will go about you know, in the same program, you ask the participants, okay, how do you feel, okay, when you attend the program, okay, what do you think, what do you um, realize, you know, so that is the qualitative strategy, you ask them how they feel, how they perceive something, okay, whereas in quantitative, you just look at the how effective, okay, uh, maybe the number of people who are um, recycling stuff, okay, and you get the numbers for that. So that is quantitative. But qualitative is more about feelings okay, and emotions. Right? So um, narrative analysis is usually about a story. Okay. And this is why um, when you interview people, okay, you have the chronological story and you look at how people uh, explore that, you know, sequence it. So it will be very different. In one um, situation or one event, maybe there's 10 people in there and 10 would give, you know, probably very different narrative. So you try to explore, okay, how, why people um, say different things, okay? Right, so... There's a lot of others, basically, but I don't want to uh, confuse you too much because, for example, cultural study, I don't think anyone is doing any cultural studies or gender studies, okay? But if you are, then you are free to look into that further, okay? So in qualitative inquiry, right, I put this here just very um, something that I want to share. So it's, uh, you can basically start anywhere with qualitative. It can be that you um, already know the sample, you know the sampling strategy that you want, and then you plan your data analysis. Or you can start at, you know, the focus of inquiry, which is usually how you start with quantitative study. Okay, so it has different approaches it's totally dependent on you whether uh, where you want to start and what you want to include in your study okay for qualitative inquiry because it's very fluid i can say um, it doesn't have a specific um, specific systematic methodology compared to quantitative study okay uh, all right the role of literature Okay, this is something that I also want to highlight because, you know, literature in uh, qualitative study is very, very important. Okay, it's even more so than in quantitative study because you, even at the start, okay, you gather your data using, uh, from the literature. Okay, so you get your theoretical or empirical or methodological data and then you gather the data that you want, okay? For example, you do your interviews or you do your focus group discussion, and then you go back to the literature because you want to um, compare that to what's already out there, okay? And then you data, you do data gathering again. Uh, so it happens a couple of times. It depends on what you want to find, okay? And lastly, you analyze that. Right. So it might not um, be, you know, 
this is why I say that qualitative study is quite different from quantitative study. Okay, like in the beginning, I told you that there are some similarities. That's true. But with qualitative study, because you usually you don't have a um, specific methodology. Okay, so you base that on your uh, literature and your findings. And it, um, it creates a new theory. So for example, you, um, you start your data gathering. Okay, so what I can share with you, what my friend did, okay, he was studying, um, he uses qualitative study and he was studying the behavior of people um, towards, you know, recycled material. Okay, so what he did was at the beginning, he doesn't even know like what are uh, people's perception, okay, towards recycled materials. So he gathered all the data um, from literature, okay. So he looked at uh, papers, he looked at books about, uh, you know, what people, what are people's feelings about recycled materials. And he found that like, maybe 15 to 20 words representing that feeling. Okay, so that's how you got um, the first data gathering. You got that data, you got that 20 things. And then um, you go again to the literature and you try to uh, find the theory behind that. If they have, if they don't have, then it's something that you need to work on. Okay, and once he did that, he actually clustered that 20 into seven things. All right, and then he um, he designed the interview questions, you know, based on that seven things, and he did the second data gathering, which is when he approaches people and interview them. Okay, and you know you got that data, and people might surprise you. Okay, remember in um, you know in this sort of uh, study you are relying on people's words. So it might not be, uh, people might not see the 20 uh, things initially that he found. So in the end, he got like 30 or 40 things and he needs to work that out again. So maybe, so he goes back again, look at that, you know, and lastly, he did his analysis. So you can imagine why, how um, it's quite laborious in terms of qualitative. But it's something that is, um, it has its own strength, okay? So um, in qualitative data, you have a few methods of collect collecting the information. Okay, you can do interviews, and this is structured, semi-structured or conversational. Okay, there are methodologies, specific methodologies for this. And um, we might look into it a little bit because for interview, um, we can also do that in quantitative study, okay? Um, so instead of survey, we can also do interviews, right? So I think it might be also be useful to cover this later on, you know, how to structure the questions. And then, um, yeah, right. So I'll go very briefly, sorry guys. Next is observation, okay, you look at um, people, okay, so you collect the data in their natural setting, right, so it can be overt or it can be covert, but you have to remember, if people know that they are being observed, they might behave differently, okay, so you have to take that into consideration. Right, um, next one is visual sources, okay, so you can include photographs, films, videos, okay, and um, it's good to document lifestyle, right, living and working conditions, but of course, you only have one perspective, only the one from the camera, you cannot, um, so for example, if you have a camera, compared to when you are actually there, you might get different data, okay, and you have to also remember, in front of a camera, subject's behavior may be different, right? Um, so 
unobtrusive measures, this is usually uh, you're using documents, okay, reports or business plans or contracts, something that is already available out there. So you don't um, really go and uh, interact with the people. Okay, so you're only based on the secondary data. So this is also possible. And lastly, research diaries. Okay, so research diaries, you know, you have your um, lab uh, reports or uh, lab folder before. Okay, this is something that is also uh, what you can do to collect data, right? In particular, the processes involved, okay, in making contact. So, you know, you when you do, when you approach people, you have your own notes, okay? So, that can be a source of um, data as well. So, for previous people who are doing that study, you can look at their notes, right? But of course, it's uh, the interpretation would be um, have some bias because the one who is writing it, okay, it's not you, right? So to sum up, okay, there is a different perspective on quantitative and qualitative study, okay. And if you remember, like in the beginning, I mentioned positivist and interpretive. So this is actually another way of looking at quantitative and qualitative study. Okay, so with positivists, uh, it's basically on data, so it's quantitative study. Whereas for qualitative study, you look at um, words, images. Okay. Right. So um, remember, we have. Test two. So th that is on literature review, okay? And I just want to highlight even while you're doing your research design, okay, you are still doing your literature review actually, okay? And it's also something that is, uh, is useful if you can include that in your literature review chapter, okay? So basically, uh, what sort of design you're going to do, okay, you can put that into your literature review because if you look at that, um, everything relates back to literature review, your research design, your instrument, data collection, sample. Okay. So bear that in mind. Okay. Not, not um, I mean, if it's something that you cannot do in, uh, you know, in test two, you might be able to include that in the final proposal later on uh, at the end of the course. Okay. So uh, just a quick recap on literature review because I don't know um, if you guys are okay <laughs> hanging on there with literature review. Okay, because we it's also something it's very important basically, right? So remember, you have to be critical and analytical, okay, when you are uh, reviewing the literature, okay, and you have to place uh, your own research where it is in the existing uh, literature. And uh, the characteristic, okay, research trends. So when you uh, study, when you look at the literature review of your topic. Okay, look at the research trend. Okay, and assess the strengths and weaknesses. Okay, identify potential gaps. This is very important. Okay, and you need to establish the need for current and future research projects. Okay, so that all should be included in your literature review. Okay, this is just to answer because I receive a few questions as well, like what to put in literature review. And also, I remember last week, um, someone asked about this as well. Okay, that's why we went back and look at literature review again. Because, right, so for um, test two, I'm going to include this so you can um, look at that. So basically, um, I have, I have um, put there like what 
is expected in Richie Review. Okay, so two page minimum. Okay, I don't mind if you have like, usually try to stick to 1.5 uh, spacing. Okay, not too, not too spaced, but because that's very wide. Okay, 1.5 is uh, just nice. Um, yeah, so these are like examples of the topics that you might um, include. Okay, it totally depend on um, your own research topic. Okay, so here is just, I just select one multiple uh, solid ways. Okay, so remember the deadline for test two is 4th of December, so we still have, you still have like 10 days, okay, um, and it's two page minimum, so this is the review, yeah, okay, so you have your, um, of course, you need to have your um, first page, the title page, very similar to the one that you submitted last time for test one, okay, you can also use that, the same one as well, so I'm not, um, creating, you know, a limit on the title page. But for the literature review itself, you have to include all of this. Okay, do you have any questions? No. No. No, okay. Don't worry, I will include this in um, Putra Blast and also Teams, okay? But I think for test two, we will um, do the submission through Putra Blast, okay, because we need to also have, I don't know if you guys know this, but for blended learning, we have to um, also use Putra Blast. So, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I, uh, usually I update both, okay, so the notes are available both in Putra Blast and also in Teams, and it's similar. So you can use either one to access it. And uh, one final thing is about video. Okay, so the previous lectures videos are uh, uploaded into YouTube. So you can always uh, go back and look at that if you want to listen more <laughs> or you made something in the, in the middle or somewhere. Okay. So, um, any other question, maybe? So let me... Yes, doctor, I have a question. Yes, doctor, I have a question. All right. Um, let's take this solid waste as example for this literature okay. review. Mm -hmm. If, um, if my, to my topic is like, um, talking about the effects of like improper uh, management. Mm -hmm. Um, for this case, um, can I include like something just, but it's not really directly related to my topic. But can I put it in my literature review also, or yes. it's not appropriate? Um, you can include that actually. So remind me again, what is your title? You want to look at the the title, your title. My own title. Yeah. Um. I'm. It's about the social economic status, the relationship between the status and the, uh, a wage generation. Okay. Okay. All right. So you want to include challenges of uh, waste management? Is it? Um. Um. For my objective, I do not include the effect, but I'm because um for now I'm quite confused what to put in in my literature review. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Um, you, if you look here, okay. Uh, so you actually in literature review. Oh my God! Why is that not out? Okay, in literature review, you can include discussions about you know previous studies in the same research area. So if you want to, um, you know, touch upon challenges of waste management, for example, I'm just giving, throwing some ideas out there. You can include that as a sort of the beginning, you know, so you want to really highlight, okay, there's a problem with waste management and these are the challenges, okay? And one of that 
is due to the social, um, you know, social situation. <laughs> I can't find the right word for it. So, so, so social, um, maybe economic um, situation of a population. Okay. And then you go, you know, that's how you make it flow, basically. So you have a very um, broad problem, so to speak. And then you uh, zoom in on one specific thing, which is basically what you, you are trying to do in your research. Okay, that's also possible. Or the other way around, you can also um, look at what are the, you can also review what are the programs that uh, have been done to tackle, you know, waste, waste uh, problem, for example. Or um, you can also go very specific, directly looking at the social impacts towards waste. I'm sure there's already some um, literature on that. So you can actually combine that, okay, in one topic. So maybe 2.1 is um, waste, uh, social or economic um, factors, you know, effects towards waste management, for example. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is it's not, um, not set in stone, basically. You are free to describe your literature review how you want it, okay? But you have to bear in mind at the end of the literature review okay people who read it can understand oh okay so i understand what you're trying to say why you are doing this research okay so my suggestion would be at first describe the problem okay second you link that problem to your own research or your own approach how you're going to tackle that problem or rather than the problem, maybe the um, cause, okay? If your research is about, okay? So you have lots of different cause, you review that, then you go specific to your own, um, what you want to study, okay? The economy, maybe the economy, economic situation of the um, studied population, okay? So you can see at the end, oh, okay, me, myself, as a reader, I would get, you have to think about uh, the one who is reading it as someone who have totally no idea about this topic. So you have to bear in mind, um, your literature review should give enough idea, enough background about the topic, and can um, totally understand, like in the uh, end of the literature review, why you're doing this research, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Doctor, it means that even though our topic is not really focused on challenges, but we, we still can put it in literature review. Is you it? Can, yes, you can put in the literature review, but you have to... What is the link to your research then? Okay, you can put it there. Okay, but you have to think about um, why, you have to justify why you want to put this in there. Okay, it must have some sort of link. Maybe it's a general challenges. You're not doing challenges, but you're um, doing some other things. But the challenges might be, um, okay, so i give you an example. Okay, so maybe you're doing a program on uh, something on uh, waste, okay, but uh, people have already done that previously and they want to uh, uh, list all the challenges, okay, so you just want to give an idea to the reader, okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing this research, but bear in mind these are the challenges, so I just want to put the challenges there, okay, but then you have to think about how much information I want to put in with regards to the challenges because if it's not related to what you're doing, you don't want to put too much information there as well. Okay, just enough to give an um, give an idea to the reader. Okay. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Right. Okay. And then, um, in general, what content do we need to put in uh, literature review? Is it the results um, done by others from previous study or, or what? Okay, um, I've put that in here. Okay, so in general, in general, it should include discussions about previous studies. Okay, because you really want to uh, make sure that you have some basis about what you're doing. You're not, because I don't think any of you will be doing something that is totally new, you know, something that is um, no one in the world has ever done. Okay, it's very, very uh, hard right now to do that. It might be possible like in the past 200 years maybe but now a lot of people have already done certain certain related things so you can um you know compare what other people has done so yes you have to uh, discuss the previous studies you know in the in that topic okay right any other questions is that okay Guys, um, okay. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. I just want to. So I want to take the um, in the meanwhile. I want to take the attendance, but any other questions for now? No, happy. No, no. Huh? No, Doctor. All right. Okay, uh, don't worry too much about literature review. Okay. Um, of course, it's a work in progress, right? So try, try to think, you know, link whatever is out there, whatever is already published to what you want to do. Okay. Uh, my own my suggestion is that just think about the story. Okay, if you are doing something, a story, for example, you have to have a flow. Okay, you have to start somewhere, you have to end somewhere, and at the end, it basically highlights the importance of your study, like why you are doing this or why is it important. Okay, justification. Always be able to justify why you're doing something. That's basically what I can say for that one. Right? 